Hello and welcome to Romantic Readers Podcast. My name is Nicole and I am joined by my sensational co-host Ali and we are very excited to be bringing to you a book that is absolutely huge. Like I would say this is huge. going bananas on Book Talk, on Bookstagram. This came out in January this year but it is getting major momentum right now and that is When the Moon Hatched. So Ali, how are you? And tell us all about your experience with reading this book? Well, to answer your question, how am I? I'm exhausted because I've stayed <laughs> up reading. So it's nice <laughs> reading this book because I couldn't put it down. And because I like Nicole started it and was like, you have to read this and we have to talk about it on the podcast this week. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna get this book read. Um, but it was on. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty it's not a short book, that's for sure. Um and so I sure. have been reading it, but like absolutely wanting to read it. I was in no way feeling pressure to stay awake. Um I other than the pressure of I need to know what happens next in the story. Uh, but it is so good. I'm obsessed. I'm so glad. Like it'd been, I'd been aware of it for a while. Yeah. And then it does yeah. kind of feel like in the last maybe month, it's just really exploded. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm so glad I finally read it because it was so good. But I am I'm tired. That's how I'm feeling. It's tired. <laughs> I so I I have to thank the fantasy fangirls for starters because they promoted this and that's what perked my ears up to go oh what's this book and then I kept hearing yeah. about it and then I was like okay I need to like clear my schedule and make this a priority I need to read this book and just the first 20 pages which is basically the encyclopedia of trying to yeah, explain absolutely. the world the characters the magic system the gods like whatever it is I was just like whoa like this is so much but for me as a I guess I love a bit of high fantasy I can handle a big easter egg filled complex book I was just frothing I was like yes. this is exactly what I want like just this world that is created it was just absolutely insane the level of detail mm -hmm. and not only have I read it once but I'm nearly finished reading it a second time through because this book is like you can't just read it once you actually have to read it a second time to process everything. I've, in my second read, it's like a whole new book. I'm like, how did I miss like entire conversations between characters? How did I not notice certain things happened? Like it just, yes. because it's one of those books that the first 15 chapters, you don't even know what's going on. You're like, right. who are you? Who is that character? I don't even know how you're connected. Like you don't know what's going on, but you're having a great time. Um, by the second read through, you know all that. So you know exactly who characters are and, and how they're related and what it all means. And it's so exciting. So yeah, haven't yeah. had a book like that in a long time. And I do think um, for people who are listening and haven't yet read it, and you're going to hop off when we jump into spoilers. It's spoiler free right now, but when, you know, you can hop off later, I will say reading or at the very least skimming through that kind of like glossary encyclopedia at the beginning did really help orient me. You don't have to go into a ton of detail. You don't need to memorize it, you know, but like just familiarize yourself with it. I do think it's worth reading through that glossary to understand some of the concepts so that you're not totally like what is happening when you first when you first dive in um so if you haven't read it yet I really recommend skimming that I like tried to process all that but then I like forgot everything like once I actually started the book none of it really read like well, stuff I need, I need to like I need to find a way on my like kindle to like go back and like flick straight back to that so I can go back and go okay who is that character how are they related oh, you just bookmark it that's what I do so yeah, I can make bookmarks so that then all you have to do is click the thing and then just like click, it makes it so I, that's, that's I'm all about my bookmarks. That I, uh, don't do. <laughs> I will say I'm like sitting here recommending like, oh, read it. But when I first sat down, I, I, I mean, to be fair, I was like very tired because I had, it, it was just like a weekend and I needed a nap. So I like laid down on the couch and I like started reading that glossary and I fell asleep. <laughs> I was just like, what's going on? 
reading. And I took like a little hour long nap and it was great. And then I woke up and I was like, okay, cool. Now I'm ready to read the book. So Okay. So that glossary made you sleepy. Whereas for me, I was just, I was in that mood where I was in a mood for something like big. I think maybe the book I read before that was light. And so I hadn't sort of had something complex. So when I started reading that glossary, I was like, what am I getting myself into? Like, this is nuts this isn't just oh there's a couple of characters and this is kind of your world and you know it wasn't like a light-hearted glossary it was like no this is major fantasy like you need to know all these different things and actually yeah. it was almost scary I was like what but then the story starts and the writing is actually quite easy to process like I found her writing style almost a little bit like Rebecca Yaros I mean I definitely as a book, I feel like it's most similar to Throne of Glass. I just feel like Rave yeah, is a very, very similar character to Selena, who I adore. She's like my favorite FMC. So having Rave be so similar is right up there, but um, much more of a similar writing style to Throne of Glass um, with a bit of Game of Thrones thrown in and even the notebook, which seems bizarre, but yes, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought it was very similar to the Throne of Glass, but I also... Um, felt like it was pretty like it has fourth wing vibes you know what I mean and not just because of the dragons I think you're right some of the writing um but some of the the magic Mm -hmm. acts in a scientific way at times like and I feel like that happens in fourth wing where Mm -hmm. you know like they study the magic it's 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 a very like this thing that they you know it's not just like oh it's we don't know anything about it. Like these people are very, you know, yeah. You usually have it. like characters that are almost kind of like priests that let like, the people have the white stone and they like literally yeah. study it. And then it's like you hear the song of the particular um sort of god or magic system that you connect to, which is like earth, mm-hmm. water, air, fire, and then yeah. you sort of learn words, and then that's how you can use the magic. And yeah, it's very detailed and like just you can sink your teeth into it which is amazing which yeah yeah, as you say it's such a it's a world you just submerse yourself in which is what fourth wing felt like it's obviously has definite differences to fourth wing like fourth wing is more of your like being at a school kind of you know it's got that university kind of school experience um and then you've got a plus cross with the army and then you've yeah and then the dragons are really really um have big personalities whereas in this one dragons don't necessarily well maybe we don't know a lot about the dragons I yet they have personalities i felt like i do think they, they have personalities not in the same way that we know of that the fourth wing dragons have but the writers there are dragon writers and they do sort of have to bond to the dragon and not everyone can bond to the dragon so like that's kind of similar um obviously the way that they and they call it charming a dragon but like Okay, it's the same thing. But the, the way they do it is also very different. Yeah, it's a little bit like Game of Thrones where you have to get on the back of the dragon and you almost have to yeah. fly it to actually bond with it. Like you can't yeah. just, um, it doesn't choose you. You like right. you have to kind of get it to bond with you or you have to steal an egg and and let it hatch and then it bonds with you mm-hmm. that way. So you sort of got those two options. But it certainly yeah. filled with danger. You're not just going to yeah. have that dragon yeah. be like, I choose you. <laughs> Right, right. And for anyone who's like worried that this is spoilers, like this is not even spoilers. Like you learn yeah, most so. of the stuff in like literally the first chapter. Mm-hmm. Like we are not spoiling anything right now. Really. <laughs> it's probably going to help you to understand the story yeah. when you start to approach it. There is still, trust me, this book is filled with about a million Easter eggs. And st- like, so not much is going to be spoiled because I actually don't even think I could spoil anything because there's too much to discuss. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, should we talk a little bit? I mean, should we give, if you're, if you haven't read the book, should we do sort of like an overview of what, I mean, we've talked a little bit about what it's about, but like what it's kind of what readers can expect from the plot. I think it doesn't hurt for people just to have a little bit of a, you know, summary, basic idea of what the story is about, just to give you a bit of a flavor of it. Sorry, if you prepared something earlier, Ali, go for it. Yeah, like without any spoilers, but like as we talked about, so... Fae, it's Fae, or the, this is the world, and they have elemental magic that are tied to gods, but that's not really, I think that might be important in the future, but it's not really important yet, but you just, it's basically the magic is earth, water, air, and fire, 
Um, it's a world that's divided into like three kingdoms. So there's like a northern, a middle, and a southern. And all three kingdoms are ruled by a brother of the same like family of the Vagor family. I think that's how you say it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all of the it's sort of considered elite to have three of the elements. So and they you know, but like no one has four elements, or so we think. Um you know, and like one of the kings only has two and that's kind of considered shameful. But like most your average run of the mill fae has like maybe one or two elements that they yeah. can kind of. Two is pretty impressive. Two is pretty impressive. But to be royal, they want you to have like three. That's three. like your max. And no one yeah. has ever had four. Yet. Yeah. And so the story follows an assassin named Rave who's part of a rebellion group against the king of the Fade, which is the middle kingdom in the world. Um, and then when a bounty hunter lures her out by, let's just say lures her out, she's captured. And the mysterious Khan Vager uh, mm -hmm. rescues her and takes her back to his kingdom where she has to face some hard truths about herself. So that's like the spoiler free. <laughs> out. Oh my God. That's an interesting way of like, okay, we can we can say that it, there's a few more complexities there that we haven't got into. But let's just, yeah, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna get. We, we've got Fey, we've got dragons, we've got a world that almost feels a little bit like as, this is where I come back to Game of Thrones. First of all, it's highly complex. Yeah. Like it goes into literally the year and how a year is measured. Like that is the yeah. level of what goes yeah. to. It's like this is like what a lunar year looks like or whatever they call it. Um, and then you've got like obviously the the magic systems. It is just this huge, mm -hmm. huge world. And then there's a lot more complexity to these characters. But that's obviously part of the really fun journey that this book takes you on there's a lot more to rave than we are aware of there's a lot more than she is aware of um mm -hmm. and that's a really really fun journey to go on so um i cannot like rave about this book enough it's yeah. some tropes you can expect um kind of an enemies to lovers you know you've got you know the assassin train to kill falls in love that's a trope um yeah. force proximity definitely some force proximity so, it's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. It's, it's not your typical burn. like enemies to lovers. It's kind of it is in her opinion. He's more like like I don't like he's instantly in love with her. We he should call first. it a he fell first. He fell yeah. first. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if those things, if you like those things, then you should read this book. You can tell we're struggling more than usual, I think, to not give spoilers because it's like the world is so complex that it's hard to even talk about what you like without spoiling anything. So I think we just need to say, like, go read it. Nicole and I could not yeah. recommend it enough. Like this exactly. is this is like worth the hype on Book Talk and Bookstagram. It is worth every like all the attention it is getting. And it needs to be like the top of your TBR. Yeah, I think so. I think if you have if you love Fourth Wing, Throne of Glass, Sarah J. Mass. If those are your books, I think you're going to love it. I think it's yeah. been a really interesting book. Like you go kind of read the reviews. I mean, generally it's got amazing reviews, but when it very first came out, I think a few people were like, ah, oh, I don't know whether it got a huge hype that I missed, but a few people were like, oh, it wasn't worth the hype. But it's since grabbed a huge amount of traction in the last couple of months as I think maybe people that didn't know about it have jumped onto this book and gone, what is this book? How did I not know about it? This is insane. Is I need to read it about five times. Like literally someone contacted me today and said, I've read this book five times. How many times do people read a book five times over? Like that to me just tells me. When it's me only been out for five months. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and even for me, I, I rarely read a book twice through, rarely. So for me to be at that end and go, I have to go back and read it again. Like that was caught a mist and fury for me. I finished that and yeah. I just went straight back to the beginning. I was right. like, I'm yeah. not ready to leave this yet. I'm going straight back. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think we'll jump into spoilers very soon because it's absolutely painful to sit here and not go into it, but highly recommend if you've not read this, like go and order it and read it immediately and then come back and process with us so yeah yeah because we we need it we're I feel like we're gonna make this episode we're gonna do this and then in maybe like a month we're gonna be like oh my god everything we thought about it like we have brand new theories you know you know because it's gonna sit with us and process with us for a while exactly. so we may have to do like a follow-up theory video you know in a month if we think stuff. <laughs> okay 
spoiler zone time. We are jumping into spoilers. So leave now. Goodbye. We will see you when you read the book and come back. But otherwise, we are jumping into the spoiler zone. So for everyone else, welcome. We are going to like just devour everything that we process from this book. Ali, talk us through it. Okay, spoilers, you can talk about it. All right, first thing is all I wanted to say was when we were talking about the tropes, I was like, reincarnation, amnesia. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm like sitting there reading our even our notes. So we have like a no- notes where we're like, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. And then I was sitting there reading the notes and I was like, wait, that's a spoiler. That's a spoiler. That's a spoiler. It's like, it's kind of a spoiler. I was yeah. like, oh, I feel like you can say it's reincarnation amnesia. Like, I think that, I don't know, I feel like it kind of comes out fairly yeah. early in the book that like Ray right. doesn't like she's clearly got some stuff buried in this lake that she keeps talking about this lake what is this lake like I'm just like is this like it seems like she's really like concentrating on burying stuff under the layers of the lake and I'm like is this just like a figment of her imagination or is this actually some physical like controlling of water and suppressing memories so I think I I think she's I think we find out for sure that she's a four bead, that she can yeah, control yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah um, okay. I, I I took the lake as really just like this kind of a metaphorical place for herself as at like that represents the way that she suppresses memories and that because she is so traumatized, she is rep- for her that really manifests in this physical kind of thing that she can see. But I also would not be surprised frankly if there's more to it and mm. this is i already have a theory here um <laughs> We're like, just maybe into it, guys like there is no oh, wow. yeah. reason to we are just yeah. processing so we are we're just going to jump into theories so yeah enjoy <laughs> i have a theory that at some point she's gonna like really look at the lake and it's gonna mimic the loft the lake in the yeah, the fern that she like, you know, because she spends a lot of time watching that lake and like along the edge of that lake and swimming in it. And so like my this is like just like a tiny theory that she's going to kind of like be in her little frozen lake and she's going to look up and she's going to be like, oh, this is actually the loft. And then maybe yeah. she'll like melt it or something to make it match the loft. And then that's how she'll get like all her memories back. Something that's been really interesting on my second read, and this is something I just read last night, was we just had where the other, the other, which I'm predicting yeah. is the dra- her dragon, yeah. like, like her, her, her dragon from her previous life, because they've obviously somehow morphed together. I think that's pretty yeah. evident by the end of the book. And so that other has just gone and like attacked for the first time after her friend got killed um, and, and then she gets captured. And anyway, she speaks about the lake and she says the lake is now all torn up. It's all torn up. It's all broken everywhere. And she's having to like pack it back down again. Like the mm-hmm. other kind of broke free from that lake and exploded out of it. And now she's having to repack it down. So that's why I'm like here going – my first thought was that it was just kind of a, you know, just something, just a way that she imagined to control her yeah. sort of powers and her memories. But part of me is also like, is it actually something a bit more physical than metaphorical? Um, I think it's quite interesting. I feel like there may be a somewhat physical aspect. And then there's just the whole, like the fact that she has been reincarnated, that she went up and was a moon for like a hundred years before falling yeah. back down to earth. And like, let's just, let's just talk about that for a moment like that yeah. is like enough of a <laughs> yeah oh my god and somehow moment. like the soul of her dragon got in high into her and so did yes. her and like I it, it's crazy and I wonder is she gonna remember that at all like is there gonna be yeah you was know is she gonna remember this yeah that- was there any consciousness was the dragon conscious for all of it did the dragon I'm really curious, like, why the dragon fell when it did. Was that a choice that Slatar, I think, made? Yeah. Yes. Was that a choice? Did it just happen accidentally? I yeah. suspect oh, that it was not an accident. That, like, there's something important about this moment that the dragon fell. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Like, I mean, I think you could theoretically say maybe it takes a hundred years for the healing to take effect and for it to get to the point where they had fully 
merged together and she was ready to return to earth. I mean, I think that was kind of my first theory, but now I'm kind of like, well, maybe there was intention. And does it also suggest that are the other moons the same? Like uh, uh, many of the other moons, do they also have a, like a rider and are they also like, could they also fall to earth in the same, sorry, here I'm saying earth, but fall to the land in the same way. Um, Oh my God. And then it's like, there's the daughter and there's a lot we can go into, but let's try and keep some kind of process to it. Uh, Well, see, the next thing I jumped into was then also when she did come, she keeps talking about loss and she talks about this character Fallon, who was the first person that she lost. And we don't even know who this Fallon is. It's like, who is this? And part of me is going, is this repressed memories from like her dragon or is this another character that's happened in kind of the 20 years that she's been back on the you know land and, you know, living life? Yeah. So I had that question too, kind of all along. I think I feel like that somewhat got answered in the epilogue when we are in the Scavenger King's perspective. And he's talking about, you know, his firelark, which is firelark rave and he like talks about how like he gave his firelark a friend you know i can't remember the exact specifics but i do think we kind of get confirmed in the epilogue that fallon is just at least the way i interpreted it though again i feel like there could still be more that fallon was just like a friend that he gave her to help control her yes and and can i just who is the scavenger king like, did I miss him? I'm still, I'm still in partway through my second read, but I'm just like, he just kind of popped in at the end and it was like, who is this character? Who is the scavenger king? Has he already been in this book or has he just entered now? Like, I'm confused. Yeah, yeah. So he, we definitely only got his perspective at the end. Yeah. But I think we hear, we get like tiny little, we don't even get really like full memories. We just get these like tiny allusions to him from yeah. Rave's point of view. So this is what I think I know. Okay. This is what I think I know. <laughs> Rave <laughs> falls to the ground. Eluin. Yep. Eluin yep. falls to the ground. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, the scavenger king finds her. Yep. And yep. he is a bastard son of the old king. Austern is his yep. name. Oh, I just had killed. to open up my Yep. Pinnacle. Correct. Okay. Khan so the scavenger him. king is a bastard son of Austern, which means he is the half brother of Khan, uh, Tyrothus, Tyroth, yeah, and the three kings, the three kings, the three kings. The three yeah. yeah, he's the half brother of them. So, but they don't know about him. So, Eluin slash Ray falls to the ground. The scavenger king finds her, and then he keeps her in some kind of prison where he makes her fight. In it's like a fighting ring. Mm-hmm. And he kind of runs the fire ring and he calls her the fire lark. We don't really know why. And that something to do with fire has like really scarred her, made her very afraid of fire. Um, I don't, what I don't, I don't know that we have found out is whether the scavenger king knew who he had. Yes. Did he know that he had Eluin slash rave or did he just think he had found someone? Yes. I don't yes. know. But he seems to have like a weird, based on that epilogue, he seems to have some kind of like strange obsession with her, Um, which is going to be nerve wracking for if he has like a weird, like romantic obsession with her, what that means for (laughs) Kibari. Yes. Well, I also got the feeling that maybe is is his thing with Kazari or is it with Rave now? Like, is he kind of like, I'm going to marry Kazari and like start the next generation? Because this is the other thing that, oh God, I'm going sidetracking here. But like, Kazari is like an adult. Like she's, you know, we- She's at least a hundred years old. Exactly. As a matter of fact, this is one of the things that blows your mind is you're like, wait, I'm like, her daughter is probably older than her if she's like being paused in time. Like she's probably only about 50 years old, whereas the daughter's like a hundred. Like this is just- Bizarre, but then also the daughter still feels youngish. Like it's like yeah. feel like it's your mind is kind of exploding, but you just kind of got to go with it. You just kind of got to go. Okay, go yeah. this is what happens with time travel and all this kind of thing. You just kind of got to go with the flow and yeah. trust in the process that it's all going to make sense in the end. Yes, yeah, trust in the process because you're just sitting there like, 
what is happening? Oh my God. <laughs> this is why you have to read this book multiple times because you yeah. need to try and process these things and hope to gather enough information to understand it and go, okay, I think that makes sense now. But the Scavenger King is definitely still this brand new character. Don't know his intentions. Don't know how much he knows. All we know is he exists. He's kind of got an obsession with rape and he's currently kind of holding Kazami the daughter. Right. That's all we know yeah. at the moment, really. Yeah. As and definitely. he has like, beef with the three brothers he wants to take them down yeah yeah and definitely having rave or a Lewin is going to be a huge factor of that and we have to wonder is he going to use the daughter to kind of lure them in um in the next book yeah. that's obviously going to be a big thing just that in itself right so I think this book series was meant to only be two books I think like two Are you kidding books. me but I can't see this only being two books. I'm like, hell no. How, like, the, how can she wrap that up in two books? That does no, not. No, I feel like it's got to be like five, <laughs> three. At at least. Least. Seven. I'm like, no. I mean, I could see how if the main plot is just to defeat the brothers the two, you know, the scavenger king and then the two twins mm -hmm. and then for Khan and Rave slash Eluin to kind of take over the world. I could see how you could do that in three books, mm -hmm. but it sort of feels like there might be multiple layers of villain, right? Like maybe they'll defeat the brothers only to then have to defeat the scavenger king only to then like have the world ending because all the moons are falling or something like, you know, I, I like, I could see how it gets really expanded. So it'll yeah. be really yeah. interesting where the, the series goes. I hope she does go big, go big at home. Cause I think yeah. this story is as big as sort of a uh, game of Thrones kind of level where mm -hmm. you've got, you've got that original story and then you've got potential for a bigger story. And then you've got a potential for an even bigger story if you let it go on long enough. So I hope that she, hopefully she gets the green light now to say, people love it. Give us 10 books. It's all, you've got permission. So mm -hmm. fingers crossed that's what we get. But yeah, looks like we're going to be waiting a while though. It looks like 2025 before we even get this. I think all 2025 is what she said. Yeah. If it is oh. a duology, that will be, crazy and very disappointing I think to me yeah yeah all right do we want to give a little bit of uh structure to this uh podcast today and do we want to give a little bit of a summary of the book and what happened since we've just like got excited and just jumped straight into like, our initial thoughts and feelings we yep. had to yeah we, we absolutely had to. and there's so much more we can go but let's try and keep a little structure and then we'll get into more thoughts and theories very very shortly Sure. Yeah. So if you maybe read this book right away in January and you are like, I can't, you guys have been talking and I can't remember anything. It's only barely coming back to me. <laughs> we can give you a summary <laughs> or if it's been even just like a month or something, if you're like me, you forget the plot. Like two days. I will tell you, this was one of the hardest. Me. Yeah. This was one of the hardest plots I've ever had to write. Um, <laughs> this is, was harder than CC, like the CC books and the CC mm -hmm. books were hard plots mm -hmm. to write. I am sure I missed a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to tell you right now. I did my very leave it at what you've already said at the, at the beginning of just how little, like what it's about. Like we can also just leave it there. This is going to be a very yeah. basic summary. No high expectations, guys. No high expectations. Bring your expectations to the bottom for me. Okay. And then I will I be know. able to bring them, but bring them to the lowest level. All right, here we go. Okay. So Rave is an assassin for the rebellion and we start the story with her on a mission. She poses as a singer in his prestigious club to lure her Mark so that he will follow her home and she can kill him. But then she catches the eye of another mysterious and alluring stranger. She is successful in her assassination of her Mark. But after dumping the body, the mysterious stranger appears and she cannot bring herself to kill him. And that's not normal for her. Yeah. The notorious bounty hunter Rex Zaros is on the hunt for her and for just people from her rebellion rebellion. So she's told to lay low and that goes well until her best friend slash sister character is stabbed and Rave discovers it was Rex who did it to lure her out, um, which was just heartbreaking. I did not expect her, her bestie. I can't even remember the name anymore to die so quickly. That was, that was like a very games of game of Thrones moment for me. Like, yeah, whoa, okay. yeah, yeah. Very quickly. We get like a main character, someone that she loves dying like yeah. straight away. And just as like that character has said, I love you. And then she didn't say it back and then boom, character dies just yeah. to add extra pain for our race. So much pain. So, yeah. 
Um, some other being called the other takes over her and she goes on a killing spree only to be captured by Rex. So she's captured by him. There's a scene where she bites off his finger, which is really gross. Um, <laughs> she is sentenced to die by dragon feeding. So they, this is how they deal with their criminals. They just like string them up and then the dragons come and eat them. Uh, but this mysterious man shows up and heals her, has her healed just before the execution. And she discovers that he's actually the king of the Northern territory, the burn. Um, and, and just quickly, like it's always really interesting because he always picks her up with her smell. Like she's always had her face yeah. covered up because it seems like in this place you tend to only like, you know, you kind of cover up, you only show your eyes, but he gets her scent and then he's just like, like and so first he's fascinated by her like at the club and things, but by the time she's all like imprisoned, he's like, you smell like someone I know. I haven't slept in five days. I have to see who you are. I have yeah. to see who you are. I and Raven's to. not like, no, no. Cause she's got this whole thing that she doesn't want to remember anything. She sort of has an awareness that there are memories that she's keeping repressed and she likes them that way. She wants to keep them down low buried and she's yes. kind of worried this is going to bring stuff up for her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So ex execution day comes and the largest dragon she's ever seen <laughs> appears and scoops her. That's the real story. <laughs> what? <laughs> Eats her, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> that's the end of the story. No, he scoops her into his mouth, but he doesn't eat her. Uh, and and we get this very descriptive scene of what it's like to be in a dragon's mouth. And then he spits her out at the feet of the king, and his yes. name is Khan yes. Nagor. Uh, he then whisks her away to his territory, starting at the cutest little cabin and lake area, yes. where yes. she is very confused by her feelings for him and her attraction to him. After a, oh, go ahead. <laughs> pause, pause for a moment. All right, this scene, like, I thought we were going to get a little spice scene at 50%. Like, this was like, yeah. so, okay, they're at the cabin and she's actually thinking, I'm going to escape and I'm going to kill him. She's like, I need to kill him because he's dangerous for me because, like, yeah. I'm going to remember stuff I don't want to remember and I think I just need to kill him. So she's gone to kill him. So he's asleep on, like, the, the lounge and she's like, got her knife to his throat and then all of a sudden it turns he wakes up and it turns spicy it turns yeah. real spicy like, real cool. out of nowhere out and of i'm nowhere. just like i'm just thinking ali's little treat i'm just like i'm getting my little and then i'm like oh my god i'm like i thought we we're gonna get a spice scene i was like right at the last moment she's like oh this is just sex and then he's like oh wait no i don't i don't, I don't, I don't want that i don't want that so yeah. <laughs> but you, it, even though it's not a full site spice scene it is still enough of a treat to keep you going. Oh, you know, oh. you need that little treat. It's a solid ginger. It's a solid ginger. And it's a yeah, really it's nice, solid, solid exciting ginger. moment. It's a little ginger candy. That's what we should start calling it. It's a little ginger candy treat yeah. uh, at 50%. <laughs> so, okay. So after a hot and heavy makeout session, which is what I wrote, uh, she escapes only to be captured by a warrior clan who insists that she is some kind of savior and that warriors are going to fight for the right to marry her. And they do. And she's very confused and this guy wins. And then she's like realizing what's happening. And she's like, Oh, uh, -uh I'm not marrying you. So she's like, okay, I'm going to fight for myself. Um, so she does. And she ends up losing because the guy who's supposed to marry her is playing dirty tricks and yeah, hasn't been yeah. he like it. he doesn't he have a snake or something yeah he, he has like, a snake yeah, and yeah, like yeah and it bites him out and it bites her and then she yeah so so she's like about she's about to lose and so just when all seems lost in the most romantic epic moment you could ever have con shows up on and his dragon like. <laughs> trying to claim her now Again, I'm sorry. I have to pause again. You have to pause. Another yeah. really important little snippet happens in this thing. And this is, they're talking about her and they talk about her children and why she's really important, why they're fighting to oh, the death yeah. of her hand. They say, your children will permanently keep the moons up in the air. Your children will keep the moons up in the air. And so like, they're all like now vying for her hand in marriage mm -hmm. so that they can have her babies, which she's freaking out. Cause she's like, I take birth control every month. I have no intention of having children anytime soon. So yeah. hell's no go away. Yeah. Yeah. I have no interest in kids, which is ironic finding out what <laughs> no we'll find out later yeah. um okay so she just when all seems lost Khan shows up beats the shit out of the warrior trying to claim her 
gives her his Malmer, which is like, oh, such a moment. Like, he like gives it to her. It's so cute. It's sweet. I know. And- I mean, that moment she's gone all like, she's just given into her like innate need to be with him and stuff. And she yeah. just like accepts it. And she's like, they're saying to him, don't die. And she's I'm like, so just- worried about him, like clutching it to her chest. <sighs> It was so everything. Nice. It was so yeah, powerful. It was really cool. mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he wins, he scoops her up, takes her back to his palace. Um, and this is where again, I could go into a lot of detail about what happens in like this whole thing, but I'm not going to because I think we're gonna talk about a lot of these scenes. But basically, once she's at the palace, she's shown some uncomfortable truths, namely that she is the lost lover of Khan, former heir to the Shade Throne, Queen of the Shade through her marriage to one of Khan's brothers, mother of the current princess, Carrie carrying the Aether Stone, Kizari. Um, Kizari is also Khan's daughter, not Tyroth's. Um, you know, they have some amazing spicy scenes. Like, oh, there's just a lot there. And so, but basically, there's actually not a ton of plot from that point forward. Well, I think the important thing to outline here is she doesn't know all this. We know a lot of this you know as readers, but mm-hmm. she doesn't know all of her story she only learns some of it like she That's like true. she learns that like she is uh, she was a Lewin and she was betr- potentially like betrothed to Khan but then left him um for one of the other kings but she doesn't know her full truth she doesn't know about her daughter and and Khan keeps going like I'm gonna tell you like there's someone that needs you more than I do and I have to tell you but she's still kind of like no 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 I don't want to know I don't want to know and then like drama yeah. happens and he never gets a chance to tell her yeah and that's kind of yeah and then it ends with the epilogue that we've you know we've already talked about with oh, the scavenger oh, king yeah. so yeah I mean she gets to kill like um that bounty yes. hunter like which is like yeah. very satisfying and that was like the satisfying ending I think what was interesting about this book it was it actually gave you a fairly satisfied ending like it gave you an ending like it didn't have them finishing on a cliff you know about to die or something terrible happening it sort of ended slightly positive but still with heaps to kind of explore like yeah. she she had to leave Khan to go and try and kill this bounty hunter and he's just said come back to me but he's still fine she's still fine like uh we nobody just worry that about, you know like there's no yeah well the only thing is the daughter the daughter is obviously being yeah. has been captured by kazami and we've had the sister we've had khan's sister realize find her diary and confirm um the truth that uh kazami is actually khan's daughter um yeah. but they didn't know that so there's lots of little easter eggs of like oh like there's stuff's gonna happen but it doesn't leave us with this like ending that's painful that we hate and we're thinking oh my god like are, are our characters gonna be okay like generally right now they are okay which is kind of refreshing yeah yeah definitely <laughs> um yeah you know it is interesting though it doesn't have like a traditional story arc like there's not really a central plot driven conflict that gets resolved um you know with a conclusion it's the the conflict and i put that in quotations is really the discovery of information i mean that's yeah. really it's kind of it's almost like structured like a mystery uh mm-hmm. which i find so fascinating i'm sure there's people who know a lot more about story structures and story arcs that would have a lot of interesting very interesting things to say about how this is plotted but that to me it was just so well, strange yeah, but right it now works. Like it works yeah. and it's so good, yeah though. well the big sort of arc is i guess her amnesia and her not right. knowing about who she really is and her trying to get that and then of course there was the real slow burn and her build up in the relationship with Kant, and then her obviously at some point finding out about her daughter those were sort of the arcs but we didn't have like a a war that's going to happen or something like that like we right now the other two kings don't know that she is back they think that Aluin is dead and they don't know about rave they don't know that rave and her are the same so and right now um khan is keeping that very very much a secret so mm. we don't have that there's sort of a major conflict that will potentially happen we have been given the hint a bit like game of thrones where we've kind of had this suggestion that the moons may fall to the ground at some point and this could be an absolute destruction of the world if this was to happen so mm-hmm. we know there's this sense of danger 
messenger. We know there's this God system and there is this ether stone, this black stone that um, Aluin had to wear before she died. And this like takes the energy out of the people that wear it. And now it's worn by the daughter who I'm just like, I feel so sorry for anyone that has to wear it. And she's, She's actually fallen in love with this stone. Like, she's like, I can hear him. She's like, I can hear yeah. him. What's oh, I forgot name? about that. Kalis, Kalis or Salus, yeah. um, Kalis, the, the god that's in this stone, because they realize, the other gods realized that he was the one that was bringing the moons down to the to the ground. And so they said, right, we've got to kind of cut him up in little pieces and put him in this stone. And since then, he's been kept in this stone. But he is, like, in so much pain and agony. He's crying. He is... Like I don't, I don't know what he's asking, but Kazami seems to be the first one that can hear him. She can hear his song, I guess, and she's actually said, "I'm in love with him. Mm-hmm. I'm in love with him." And and Khan's like, "Whoa!" He's like, "Okay, that's a lot." <laughs> yeah, she's in love with the stone. Does she need therapy? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Kazari is going to be a very interesting character. Um, I feel like we could get a whole book just on her and like 100%. her journey and her path. And yeah, it's super, super interesting. Yeah. Um, she could actually and I, I, I also, you know, what we don't know is we don't exactly know the timing of when Eluin was killed and then, you know, Slatar took her up into the sky. We don't know if that was right when Kazari was birthed if it was a couple of years later, I suspect my theory is that it was like the moment Kazari was born yeah. and that the yeah. Aether Stone was put on Kazari as a newborn infant. And that that is why she has this different relationship to Kalis the God, because he's been with her her entire life. Yeah, whereas, I think that is the case. Yeah. Previous wearers of the Aether Stone got it as adults. And so it may be a little bit different. So that's what I think. Exactly. I think it was hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that is a huge factor as to why it's different. I think we do get the confirmation that they said that she was a very un, uh, she was a very unhappy baby. Um, and I think that's because they put and they they thought they that maybe they weren't sure if it was the ether stone or if it was just her. But they then they applied the iron um on her and then she settled down. So we know that she definitely got it as a baby. Um, and my guess is that it was a bad birth and that that is how Lewin died. Oh, well, actually, I don't know because no, then we know that like, there's some kind of like wound to her heart yeah. that's been that has some interesting runes on it. And I think we know, I, I don't know that we know, but I think it's alluded that she was murdered, that it wasn't just, oh, she had, she died in childbirth, but no, she was murdered in the heart, yeah, potentially yeah. by Austern, Khan's yeah. father. 100%. And possibly she realized, I mean, she probably went, actually, this is Khan's baby and I actually want to return to Khan. So maybe she was going to escape and that was when he captured her and was like, don't take my baby and stabbed her. So it's very interesting. But, yeah, there's definitely a feeling that the other has a lot of beef with that king, a lot of beef, like long-term plans to destroy him and everything he cares about. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm like, who's – like how are Rave and the other – going to function in the future that's going to be an interesting situation yeah yeah like is she gonna is it gonna be like a hulk thing where like she has to learn to be one with the hulk (laughs) i know that's like the only like the best comparison i can think of is the hulk movies where he's like he like for a long time he like once he goes into his hulk mode he's like gone but then he has to sort of learn to like accept it and then he can be hulk well well, definitely what we know is When the other is in control, they have full control. Like Rafe has no consciousness when they are in control. There is like he wakes up, she's got bits of meat in her mouth, her stomach feels bad. It's actually so cute because there's like a scene where the other is talking and they're like, I've realised I probably shouldn't eat people because it seems to really upset my host. And so I'll try not to do that. Even though they're so delicious, I'm not going to eat them. (laughs) (laughs) It's so good. I, I'm really excited to like get to know 
the other slash Slitar's personality. Um, I honestly wanted like more chapters with the other, like perspectives with her. Oh my God, Um, yes. That's why it's like, even though it's such a big book, it still feels like it wasn't enough. Like, and and honestly, when you say there wasn't this big, like arc kind of um, structure, it's like we didn't have time for it. It's like if she no. had to add that in, it would have been minimum another 200 pages. She probably was like, as a writer went, I have to kind of cut this now and then put the next one in the next book because yeah. otherwise All the bad ones and stuff. this was just, this book was really, it was almost a romance. It was like, it was just Khan and Rave meeting, finally falling for each other, her kind of remembering enough to realise that they were important. Like really it was just the romance. Um, that's really even... the, the main conflict the, yeah. the the story structure is a romance yeah. and a little bit of a mystery yeah um, and then and then obviously we've just been introduced to this world and everything that's going on and those initial breadcrumbs and easter eggs for what's going to come but we haven't even got into that yet like that's still coming like give that that's going to yeah. be next book maybe even the book after that yeah it's so good can we talk about con and yes. how of course we can is like obsessed with Khan. he is everything the fact that he is just like in love with her still after so long and he's like oh, i'm gonna do whatever i gotta do and like i'm gonna tell her the hard things and i'm gonna be there to support her and i'm gonna let her go get her vengeance and he's just oh my he's god so Oh, he is just, he's like I will burn for you I will kill for you I will do everything for you he just and it's just so nice this is not a traditional enemies to lovers where like they both hate each other like she kind of hates right. him he's like oh he's a king and he's evil but he's like I love you like he sees her and he's just like like if the world stops like he has been pining for her for a hundred years yeah and he thought she was gone and he and thought that she-, she still thinks right she doesn't know he doesn't know why she left him like no from no, his no, perspective no. he's doing all of this thinking there is a world where she does get all of her memories and like still chooses to leave him and say that she doesn't love him like you know <laughs> like that is crazy. She was, like she she didn't want to she didn't want to leave him and it was only no. because of the he doesn't know that. Just still even then, I'm just like, but why? You could have married Khan and you could have had the baby with him. Like, I feel like just they should have justified that. But anyway, you know, adds to the adds to the drama. But yeah, she did need to go to protect the baby and to protect Khan. Um, and to protect Veya. It was also for Veya. Yeah. Like sister. Yeah. Because it's like, I think she probably was like, okay, I could marry Khan, Khan protect, could protect me. But like Veya is who she really, I think, was worried about. Um and yeah. con and like like so that's why she left and um but like yeah con doesn't know that no no he doesn't no, no, and no. like he doesn't know about his daughter he doesn't know about it doesn't know I about know. that there's a line and, and, yes. where he's talking to rex and at this point we don't maybe know for sure but we suspect that kazari is his daughter Mm -hmm. and he has this quote where he is like if she was my daughter i would tell her blah 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 and you're like oh that is your daughter i know i know you just like you feel it you can feel it's gonna happen it's uh oh my gosh he's just he's so dreamy he is beautiful i just his passion for her is just it's next level it's next Mm -hmm. level and it's just Mm -hmm. so good um I just, I, I need more Khan and I need them to get back together and I need it to all be okay because <laughs> yeah. I, I just cannot wait for him to kind of get this awareness. I, I think that like she, I, I think like there's this moment where Rave like, she's like, this is a good guy. Like this is the kind of guy, why did previous me leave him? Because this is the kind of guy that you keep really close. She, like, even when she's still fighting yeah. against him, she's realizing like this is the kind of this is a keeper right here this is the kind of guy you stay with so why did previous me leave him for the other king she can't understand that and it's only they are getting that um getting the diary at the end that we start to get an idea of where previous aluan where her mind was at and where what her thinking was so well and i think um you know 
uh, she says to herself, like, I would have only left him for really, really bad secrets, mm-hmm. like a really, you know, and so I think that just like, it almost like the more she realizes how amazing he is, the more scared she is, because she's like, I would have only left him for a really bad truth that I just don't want to know. Um, yeah. 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 We're still dealing with that so much frustration because she's still burying so many things that she doesn't want to remember, which yeah. makes it really hard to know that yeah. we've got to deal with that. What do you think of Rave as an FMC? So, I mean, she's a lot like Selena, um, yeah. you know, with the secrets, the assassin, the just like shutting everyone off from her. Um, I, I generally, I, like, I like her. I definitely feel like I'm going to need in book two for her to kind of accept her truths pretty quick. Like, I don't know that I can, that I want another book of her being like, I got to hide from everything and like not have these secrets. It made sense in this book, but I feel like I'm right at my limit of being able to sort of deal with that. Yeah, exactly. If it went on any longer, it would start to be frustrating because yeah. I think until now it's sort of made sense. There's been a degree of protection, but I think even Khan saying to her, it's not your job. Cause she's always like, oh, I'm doing this to protect other people. I'm pushing people away to protect them. And he's like, that's not your job. It's my job to look after myself. You yeah. just, you don't need to worry about that. That is not your job. So I'm kind of glad he really gave her that really sent that home. And I feel like I don't know. I love the fact. I mean, I thought the story was going to go that when she was like, no, nah, I'm going to jump on a dragon and I'm going to leave and I'm going to like go like get my vengeance. Um, but then she didn't end up leaving. She ended up being like, no, I actually can't leave. I'm going to go to the house and I'm just going to live there in my memories for like, so there's a part of her yeah. that actually totally wants to be with Khan and wants to be in this life. Like she might be trying to fight it, but it's catching up with her. So next book, she's going to have to accept it. Yeah. And accept it like pretty much right away. And then maybe she still doesn't get to be with Khan yet. Cause maybe she goes after Kazari or something. I don't know, but like, I, I still need her to be like, okay, cool. I'm not afraid of my truth anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Did you have any favorite scenes from this book? Any favorite scenes or any worse scenes? <laughs> I mean, I love the like whole scene where he rescues her from the Jokul clan. I was just like, when he showed up and the dragon roared, I was just like, ah, and then he gives her his little necklace. I was just so into that. Like loved everything about that. And yeah. then like, how yeah. can you not be super into like the whole multiple spice scenes that you get, <laughs> um, which I appreciate, you know, like, or multiple instances across a couple different chapters in this cool freaking cave mountain house thing yes I know I know it was so good and I love I started to get to that point in the story and I was like is there going to be spice in this book because obviously I know many many books where first book you're not going to get the spice like they there's a slow burn like maybe second book so I was kind of like are we going to get it and it was kind of looking like she was just like oh let's just have one night together and he's kind of like okay, but that's not enough for me. So I'm thinking that we're going to get, not get it. And then all of a sudden you just snap and he's like, I'm going to make you want it. I'm going to make you. Ask I'm going to make you life. want it. Yeah. And I'm um, the only thing that's like a bummer for me, this is kind of skipping ahead in our categories, but like, whatever, like things that like I would change. They allude to this whole night that they had at the festival mm-hmm. where she gets yeah. super drunk and she like tells him that she like really likes him or whatever. And all we get are allusions to that. Like, I did kind of want to see that. Like, I just feel like even if it was just like a couple of pages, like I just wanted to see a little little bit more more of it. it. Because it cuts from him, like they kind of reach this like truce moment to they're in the like cave and the spicy scene is happening. But it sounds like they went like like, they they kiss and then it's almost fade to black. Like, cause I kind of was like, Ooh, spice is kicking in. And then it was like, then they wake up just kind of like, and she's cuddling him. And I'm just like, wait, what, what? Yeah. Like, what and like, then they talk about how like they all, they went out drinking and partying and I'm like, well, I want to see that. I want to see them partying and dancing. Like, and I love that. that like later on we find out that she was totally telling him stuff when she was super yeah. drunk. Like she was like, yeah. I actually really like you, but I have to push you away because everyone that I love dies. And like, she's actually yeah. just blurted all this out in a drunken moment. So. I'm really glad she gave us that, but I also could have actually seen that. I actually could have been taken on that journey and watched that happen in real time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to see that for sure. 
I mean, just Sarah could have added an extra 100 pages, all right? I mean, I know it's already a big book, but we could have had an extra 100 pages. An extra 10. We're not even asking for more than 10 here. (laughs) That's it. That's it. I definitely, the spice scene was definitely a a peak. And also, as I said, the other little mini spice scene at the the cabin, that was was so good because that was such a surprise. I think that just shocked Mm me. Um, I also love, I mean, there's so many things I love, so many. It's hard to pick things out. But just something different we haven't spoken about yet is when she gets her next dragon, like when the moon plume goes up and it's been horribly tortured by, um, what is it, Rex. Rex. And she's like, first of all, like Rex is going to die. But then she goes and she tends to it and it's a little dragon. Like it's, But I bet it's going to be super smart and stuff. Like I feel like it's good because he also said he was really angry because the dragon like wouldn't, wouldn't cooperate with him and stuff. So I'm like, I'm so excited now because I feel like part of her healing journey, she needs that dragon. She needs mm-hmm. that moon. She needs that relationship again. Like that's going to be a huge, important thing. And I also felt a little bit of romance between dragons, between Khan's yeah. dragon and yeah. that moon Like he yeah. was super protective of it. And I was like, oh, I'm feeling a bit of like, you know, fire dragon, snow dragon going on. Yeah, I did too. I definitely, because he like, and he kept like circling and he like coming back and he didn't want to leave her. I was feeling that for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, For sure. We can just have a whole book on a dragon romance. Yeah, I'm into it. (laughs) I'm with it. We've gone through Tarn and Scales, like spice scenes in Fourth Wing. What's another one? What's another one? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Do you have any favorite quotes from this book? Yeah. So usually we exclusively pick the MMC and I have one MMC quote, but I actually for once picked a rave quote. Like I picked an FMC quote. So I have two quotes, one MMC, one FMC. So, okay. I'm going to read it in my, my best narrator voice. So this is a con. This is a con quote quote. My hope is a flame that will never burn out. Not when it comes to her. She could sink me to the bottom of the loft and it'd still burn like a sun. So good. So good. So good. So good. So good. We love it. And then my rave quote is, he's fire and brimstone. I'm shattered ice. Our collision is steam and destruction destined to dissipate, but I'll gladly burn beneath him until the world comes crumbling down. See, so it's good. funny because even though it's a rave quote, it's talking about Khan. And it's talking about talking about Khan. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of still giving the same effect. Yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah. I love that line so much. And I I want to even like break that line down in my mind because I'm like, what does it mean, fire and brimstone, shattered ice? What are these? Collision. What does yeah. this all mean? Like collision, yeah. a bit like moon falling from the sky. Like there's there's a Steamy, lot more. like we're gonna yeah. dissipate. It's yeah, like, absolutely. you can just take that on its like shallow kind of perspective, or you can look at it deeper, and there's like a lot you could even pull out of that one quote. But okay, yes. I'm gonna jump into mine, and mine also are not Khan, which is crazy. All right, That's this actually true. isn't even exactly a quote, but this is uh, something that I loved. For those who feel small and quiet, spread those wings and roar. I, is that the dedication? That's the dedication. That is the dedication. That's at the very so beginning good. Of the I and love I that love so that. Much. It just, I mean, and probably for every introverted bookstagrammer, book reader out there, I think there's something so powerful in that. And I, I don't know, I just, I think it just resonates for a lot of people mm-hmm. that you can feel like you're just this little person out there and just to say to just go for, go for it. And I just, yeah. I love it. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Okay, next one is rave. I've seen bigger, but hey, if whipping a female makes you feel like a strong boy, then don't let me stomp on your dreams. Don't worry, I can handle it. I've got enough balls for the both of us. That is so good. That, the other, that like reminds me, the other favorite scene that I have is when she is about to die. And Mm -hmm. also when she's like in her sentencing hearing, all of the moments like in the Coliseum, because she is so sassy and I love it. She is so sassy and it's so great. Like, it's so great. And there's like, there's a scene later where Vea is asking Khan, like, are you sure that it's her? And he's like, well, when she told the chancellor that he had a micro penis, 
<laughs> back yes, for me. <laughs> so it's like we know that Eluin was also sassy. Super sassy. Like, is it? Yeah. I was like, oh God, I love that. That's so great. <laughs> that is yeah exactly exactly she's just I love and and even like in the face of about to die she's like oh well oh well I'm gonna go out like you know everyone's gonna be watching I guess it's not so bad to die by dragon fire I'm gonna find out soon enough anyway like she just goes with it she's just she is just ultimate FMC like I've always said Selena or Aelin is my favorite MMC of all time so I think to have an FMC similar to that it's like you just know you're onto a good wicket. And that's what I love about Sarah's writing. Even though you've got this really complex world, I still feel like the writing is very easy to enjoy a little bit like fourth wing that it's not terribly complex. It's sassy. There's great banter. It just makes it for very easy reading, even though you've got this high fantasy complex world. So yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's jump into a couple more theories. I've just got questions here, questions that I got got left with, and I don't know if I have a theory around them, but I just wanted to bring them to this podcast to be like, what do you think? Can we have a breakdown? Let's talk about it. What do you think is going to happen with the ether stone? I do feel like there's, they're going to have to break Kalis out, right? Like they're going to have to break him out and let that magic or that his yeah. song yeah. free the fifth, the fifth kind of magic magic I, yeah yeah and and i think and I, I do think they'll find an alternative way to keep the moons in the sky or what i have potentially theorized is it's not that the the dragons won't it's not that like they'll just permanently keep the moons in the sky. It's that maybe she'll like resurrect all the dragons. And so that they won't need to, they'll have like a new way that they die or, or something like that. And so it's actually that she gives all those dragons like another chance to live. Yeah. Well, I think Kalis is such an interesting character and an interesting magic. So I talk about him being first. We go back to this real creation kind of thing that he was, existed before everything else did and then we talk and then it talks about him having no power no control and he starts to feel quite sad even though he created everyone else his power compared to the others isn't really a power um until this whole dragon thing happens with the moons up in the sky and then for some reason he seems to have the control of bringing them down to earth um but yeah and then i think that line i spoke about the you know, the line about, you know, if you feel small, spread your wings and roar. I feel like Kalis kind of falls into that a little bit as well because he felt so powerless and yeah. and he currently and is that powerless. And I think the fact that the daughter, Kazari, is so connected to him mm-hmm. seems to suggest that he's not this bad character. He's not bad, that he's possibly got goodness in him, that he needs to be rescued, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but they have yeah. no idea how to do this like she kind of says like Khan's like because she's like I want to break him free and he's like the only way to take that off your head is for you to die like you have to have a pulseless host interesting that they say it like that pulseless host I'm like that's kind of because you can maybe have your pulse stop without officially dying forever so yeah, yeah. it's going to be a complicated little cookie that they might be able to figure out but it's interesting it's very interesting I'm just want to know more about that. Mm -hmm. I do too. But yeah, I don't know that we, it's like, we just don't have enough breadcrumbs yet to fully make a full theory on it. So that's why like, if it wraps up in book two, then I'll be disappointed because I like to be able to theorize on these big, massive worlds. Exactly. exactly. All right. What do you think is going to happen with their daughter, Kazari, Kazami? (laughs) I don't think, I think it's just Kazari. Let me just. Oh, Kazari or Kazami? I've got Kazami. <laughs> I've got like Kawasaki, Let's like a, a Japanese out. motorbike. Kazari. There's no M. There's no M. Kazari. Okay. It's an R, Kizari. guys. Just in case yeah. you weren't sure. It's an R. Let's just make sure we got that correct. Kazari. Okay. Yeah. Kazari. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that she's going to be, I think it'll almost be like a secondary storyline with her. Um, in the next books because like clearly she kind of has to resolve being in love with (laughs) a stone slash god (laughs) so that's gonna be interesting um but I don't like I would be I guess I would say I would be really disappointed if 
she died. If like she no. had to die to kind of serve the greater purpose of reuniting Khan and Rave. Like I just don't yeah. I don't think that would happen. No. So I think yeah. she's gonna survive. I just I don't exactly know yeah. where her story is going yet, but well, yeah, I think we'll definitely potentially get her POV, POV next book. I think that she'll because there's the whole now she's with the Scavenger King and there's that whole side yeah. of it. And I imagine the next book we're gonna get we're kind of going to get Rave, we're going to get Khan, and we're potentially going to get Kazari. Um, she's going to hopefully be a much bigger part of the book because I think she's going to become very important. The fact that there was this whole prophecy that it's the daughter that's going to actually keep the moons in the sky or whatever. Child, but, yeah. Yeah, like I even actually wonder if at some point we're going to get a flip and she's going to become the FMC. Like we're kind of going to have – I Raven and Khan kind of be like, okay, they're sorted now. Now our focus is going to be on Kazari and her love story. So that could be very interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, like, I don't know that there even will be more children, right? It's so I guess it just makes sense that it would be Kazari who's going to be the one to keep the moons in the sky, yeah. potentially yeah. through her connection to the god, Kalis. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting what you said about that your theory that you think that maybe it won't be about keeping the moons in the sky. It might actually be about resurrecting all the moons in the sky and mm -hmm. potentially the people that are wrapped up in it. It's so interesting that that is what happened with Aluin and to kind of go, is that, has that always been the reason? Like we, we kind of hear about the moons falling prior to and but we don't know, did a, did a person come down with that or did they just fall from the sky and cause destruction? Because even yeah. the thing, right, the gods, they might not have realised the bigger intention of what was actually happening. So, And it seems like the moon plumes do a lot more damage to the earth, like yeah. to the ground than the others do when they fall from the sky. Did you get that Potentially, impression? yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. I got that impression. Yeah, they kind of like the other ones that were kind of like, oh, yeah, those ones fell, like they're not great, but they were like, oh, the moon plume fell, like that was bad. Like for mm -hmm. some reason they do a lot more destruction. They're quite dangerous. So interesting Easter eggs that we can't break down without more information. So <laughs> yeah. What do you think is going to happen next for Khan in the next book? I, I mean, I think he, I think Veya is pro, like, this is what I suspect is going to happen is like, Veya is going to come back while Rave is gone. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Khan's going to find out all the information while Rave is gone. And he's going to go ballistic, right? Like, my wife and my daughter are like, or not wife, they never actually got married, but my lover and my daughter are like missing. I got to go save them, you know, like, so yeah. I can see that happening. Um, I could also see him just deciding to like sit tight and prepare for war because he knows that it's yeah. coming. And he's like, the best thing that I can do for rave slash all you is like prepare for war. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully rave is just going to go straight back. Like she hopefully has gone, killed Rex, like satisfied that death she wanted to do. And hopefully she just then just hightails it back up to, um, yeah you know, Khan and just kind of then takes him because, I don't know, she didn't really want to leave except that she really wanted to assassinate him. And he was like, yep, that's your kill. You go and do that. So I could also see her going straight back up to Khan and then them finding out that information about their daughter together and then having to go on a journey to try and rescue her, realising that she's been captured by the Scavenger King. And then a lot of drama unfolding because I feel like the Scavenger King is plotting. He is plotting yes. on how to rule. He's and he's not just thinking about how to destroy, like, Khan. He's also looking at the other two and he's like, how do I destroy everyone and take over? Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And then and they're going to potentially be like fighting a war on both sides, like yeah. fighting the, the, the two kingdom brothers and then also fighting against the scavenger king, yeah. Um, yeah. which that could be. And something kind of tells me that the scavenger king is going to be really wanting, if he finds out that the ether stone could bring the moons down to the earth, I could see him wanting to do that to like Absolutely. complete destruction he's like that yeah. kind of like i will he's destroy the earth crazy. in order to rule yeah. to rule it you know yeah. so Absolutely. he's like bad Absolutely. man for mm -hmm. sure for sure mm -hmm. for sure
Uh, what, when do you think she will, when do you think Brave is going to get her memories back? When do you think she's going to fully remember? Uh, it's, so I, it's like, I almost wonder, is she ever going to remember? Mm, mm-hmm. I could see a world where she never actually gets her full memories back. Yeah. Um, but she just kind of learns and ha- and just accepts the truth and accepts who she is yeah. and um, builds kind of a new relationship with Rave. Mm-hmm. So, like, mm-hmm. I could see that being a very real possibility. Um, I could also see her getting her memories back, you know, in pieces. I, I agree, though. I feel like. I feel like they're two different characters and I feel like, and I feel like even Ray feels that way. She's kind of like, I'm not a Lewin, even though yeah. I am the same person and I might have elements of that. I'm now a different person to that. And I'm not that same person I was before. And I kind of don't want them to be. This is actually going to throw me into something different, which is that in this book, we had a pregnancy trope. We had a pregnancy trope. <laughs> I know how people feel about pregnancy tropes. I personally am okay with a pregnancy trope, but I know a lot of people that loathe pregnancy tropes. But I thought it was kind of an interesting way they did it in this book. Well, it's, what did you yeah, it's like the past. It's like it's already happened. You know what I mean? So it's fine. Like I I actually love it. I love the way that this was done. I I thought it was so clever. Um, I do too. I think it gives yeah. you like for starters, it's all to do with the actual plot. Like the whole yeah. plot is revolving around this. And yeah. it's like, yes, there's a pregnancy trope, but it's already happened. Like it happened in the past. This character yeah. is now like a hundred years old. So they're no longer a child. So we're not going through a whole baby childhood kind of right. aspect. There's right. no like pregnancy. It's more just like this happened in the past. There was a child and now they're all grown up and now there's all this drama that's going to unfold. So it's kind of perfect because it's like now they don't need to have a baby. Like They don't, they don't need no, to have any more pregnancy. They don't need to have, they don't have another kid. Yeah. Yep. yep. They've had offspring and now that can be explored without having like any icky pregnancy trope that people might not like yeah absolutely um so I kind of want to talk a little bit about one theory that I like that I had and I question it now so as we were originally kind of going through the book and learning about the Malmer the necklace and how it is um it's Rigan uh Khan's dragon. Yeah. And it, the the white part is actually carved from the scale of a silver scaled saber scythe, which is the the northern dragons. Yeah. And not from the scale of a moon plume, which I think is interesting. Um and, Firelock. Firelock. and there was some yes and there was like some kind of I don't remember, like, I think it was that. So Khan went, when he, like, was falling in love with Eluin, he went and talked to, like, the seer of the Jokal clan and was like, what do I do here? Because he didn't have a Malmer at that point. Mm-hmm. And yeah. she told him, you have to carve from the scale of the the silver saber scythe, because if you don't, like, you won't be worth that love or something like that. So as we were learning all of that, I was like, oh my God, she's going to bond with that silver scaled saber scythe. Like she's, yeah. she's going to, you know, because like that's the dragon in the Malmer and she is the fire lark and, you know, has, is going to have to have this real reconciliation of her fear of fire. Um, yeah. So I thought like, oh my God, that's what's going to be. And then she sort of bonded to this moon plume. So now I'm not so sure but I, I still feel like both could happen. Yeah. Um, and then I even wonder, like, because, you know, we just said there's this, like, romance almost happening between the moon plume and the and Khan's dragon. What if that is what you get? What if the silver saber scythe is actually kind of what you get when they are a mated pair and they have babies? Oh, my gosh. Yes. That would be really awesome. I mean, not that, that would- then I'm like, but how does that work with, like, why was that? kind of even if that is the case why was that needed for the melma and not a moon plume because theoretically right not because at that point when he carved that malmar um uh slatar was alive Mm. so it easily could have been like you need to carve it from the scale of slatar or whatever so I don't know. There's still something there. I do feel like that dragon's going to be really important yeah. to the story. And I feel like 
she's gonna bond that dragon too because yeah, and yeah. like Khan even says like I when his friend wants to go get one of the eggs from that dragon Khan says I almost died just trying to get a single scale yeah and so then for like Eluin slash Rave to go bond that dragon is gonna be like oh my god you're amazing yeah, 100%, like, 100%. definitely so definitely. that's like my big that's like my big theory Everything else I have is just like questions, but that's my big theory. I love that. That is so good. And I hadn't thought of that, but now that I'm thinking about it, my mind is exploding and yeah. it's definitely possibly the most powerful dragon in existence. Like mm -hmm. moon plumes are very smart and cunning. The, like the fire dragons are very big and bulky and sort of um, aggressive. Neither of them can like, like, the, they can't handle the other heats, like, like you know, the temperatures of the different places. So they're limited. But, yeah, we don't know much about that silver saber side. side. I think another mm -hmm. thing that's really interesting is Rave has this ability to just bond with nearly every dragon. Like they speak about that when she's nine years old, she manages to jump on the back of this um, massive silver moon plume, like um, the mother biggest dragon, yeah. trying to find her brother's dragon and then gets it to bond, um, you know, and that's her dragon that is now also the other in her mind. So she has an ability. So she would, if anyone mm -hmm. could like get that dragon and control yeah. it and bond with it, it would be rave, 100%. Yeah. And not only that, she has such a connection to all animals and creatures. She cares deeply about animals. So I think there is going to be something about her that can bond that dragon. But also, like, that's why, you know, she, her children are going to be able to, like, prevent the And we also have to wonder, because like, so far we potentially know that she's a four bead, that she can connect yeah. with four, but what if this is actually the fifth and she just doesn't know it because she can't talk to Kalis because he's trapped in the stone? Mm. What if that is even, like, because she obviously has been aware of the ether stone but now no longer does, like, would that have an impact? Like, would that, has that left some connection to Kalis and I don't know like but yeah they're definitely gonna remember something about him that like she couldn't do anything about before because the stone makes her powerless but now she's going to be full of power yeah like that could yeah. be a possibility yeah, but we've never had anyone having worn that ether stone now continue to be alive without wearing the crown that has taken away their power so that is I think really really interesting mm -hmm. it's, um, it's very exciting so exciting I just uh, yeah. I need the next book what did you think about this is just a really cute aspect was knee the little oh. letter that she was keeping I need you Oh my God. And then we find out that it was her daughter, Kazari, yeah. who wrote it because oh. she like returned it to Cinder and then it ends up with Kazari. So we know that Kazari wrote it at some point and wrote, I need you. Probably this like really sad, like desperate plea, you know, to her mom who's dead, you know, and yeah. just like, I need you. It, it, oh, it was like heartbreaking, but so sweet at the same time. And I feel like Ni nee is going to now kind of become that companion that Kazari needs yes. where like in the same way that it was the companion that yes. Rave yeah. needed so I bet we see Ni nee again and then like Ni nee is kind of like being a friend to Kazari I know, oh, I know. I know. and I find myself like obviously your first impression is that it's just this your child being like I miss my mom and I want my mom and I need you but then I'm also like is there more to it is there is it because uh she's wearing the ether stone and she's struggling with that why is she calling out to her mom to say I need mm -hmm. you like I obviously it's a big like I, I know I'm just like is it just the most obvious reason or is there going to be more complexity to it than what it's really yeah. about yeah so I'm super excited, but I thought it was the cutest thing ever. I even love, and that's like almost a Harry Potter, like little of magic. Yeah. Magic. There's like these little magic, like letters you can write and then you like fold them into a little, like kind of bird crane sort of thing. And off they flutter to your, I know. Whoever they're going to, it's like, it's the, I just, I love that. That's why this magic system is just so creative and beautiful. And I just, I absolutely love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any final thoughts or theories or anything that you want to talk about, about this book? 
that we know i mean i think we've kind of talked about everything we've woven it all throughout um you know i i'm just really impressed with this magic system in this world it's it's really epic i'm really i felt like the from a sort of like the craft of the book perspective like i do feel like the slow drip of information was like perfectly paced Mm -hmm. um it, yeah, it's just really solid, really good. So what are you what are you gonna rate it out of uh what's your star rating of this one? This is all the stars. This is what I wrote in our, in our outline. I was like, I can't I can't say six star because that's Nicole's thing. So I have to have like my own thing. And so now my thing is <laughs> all right. The you're stars. allowed to yeah, you're allowed to do my six star rating. Just like I now yeah. throw in gingers every now and again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so six star rating, all the stars. Um yeah, five star, six star, million stars. I, I agree. I agree. I think it's something special. It's something special. It it's the kind of it book is. when I get to the end of it and I just go straight back to the beginning and those Easter eggs and this world, it deserves six stars. It really does. It's that extra mm-hmm. book that I put up there with Fourth Wing, with Court of Mist and Fury, with those books that are just next level. And this really is that. I mean, yes, people might say it's not absolutely perfect, but neither are those books. There are things about those books that are not perfect, but I absolutely adored this world. I adored these characters. I enjoyed it so much and I cannot wait for the next books and it deserves six stars, 100%. 100%. Absolutely. so good all right well that is all we have time for today everyone so thank you so much for joining us please feel free to like and subscribe please jump on to book loverholic and ellie cats and books thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you next time bye bye